Hi, welcome. My name is Rich Willey and I'm a physical therapist and clinical biomechanist at the School of Physical Therapy and Movement Science at the University of Montana. We're located in Missoula, Montana in the United States. For the next hour or so, we'll be discussing how, can, how we can better assist the athlete in the return to run process post anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. Uh, before we kind of get going, um, I want to uh, offer a hearty welcome to everybody. So thanks for thanks for joining um, this uh, this program. And I also want to kind of reach out and um, acknowledge my co-presenters, uh, Dustin Grooms, um, as well as Claire Ardern. And I also want to acknowledge the ACL Study Day for um, helping organize um, this online webinar. So we're going to be uh, dividing the next um, hour or so into three different uh, modules. Module one will be recognizing the common biomechanical issues that can occur during running um, for the athlete post ACL reconstruction. I'd like for everybody to gain awareness during this first module of some of the key contributors um, that might uh, pose some, some trouble to the athlete. We'll then move on to module two, which will be developing a clinical strategy to set the athlete up for success. Uh, in Module 3, we're going to work on designing a return to run program for the athlete uh, post ACL reconstruction. And of course, we'll be talking about some clinical pearls that um, hopefully will uh, assist you with um, providing a, a relatively linear uh, return to running um, for the athletes that you work with. So why, do, so why should we care about running? Why, why, is this, why should we you know, dedicate the next hour or so to, to talking about it? Well, the main thing is, is that running is a, is a fundamental athletic skill. Um, and while I can appreciate that um, not, any, not everyone ha shares the same uh, love of endurance running that, that I do, uh, which is the, the bulk of my research, but I, I do think that I think everybody can acknowledge that running is a fundamental movement skill when it comes to um, uh, athletic, um, other athletic endeavors, including um, some fields or all field sports and also uh, court, uh, court sports as well. So whether or not running is going to be the primary activity that we're going to be re uh, returning to or whether running is just um, part of um, the athletic requirements to be skillful um, in our sport, um, you know, I think we can all kind of recognize that it's, a, that it's an important part of the rehabilitation process. I'm not going to speak too much on the uh, impairment-focused rehabilitation that we see here um, in this really nice continuum that was um, set up in, uh, by Clara Dern and colleagues at the, um, in their publication in the BJSM on the, on the consensus statement on return to sport. And the, the idea behind this, this consensus statement was not so much about return to sport, but more about return to performance. Um, and this idea that there's, um, we don't just go from ACL rehabilitation to return to sport. There's actually several um, really important uh, kind of intermediate steps. And as you can see, once we get past the impairment focused rehabilitation phase um, of our uh, initial uh, recovery from an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, um, we move into that return to participation. And this is where we're really gonna see uh, running uh, start to play a larger and more, more important role. Um, from there, uh, the athlete's going to move forward to return to sport and to return to performance. And uh, my assumption um, is that the other speakers will be uh, covering those aspects um, in, in quite uh, a lot of detail. But one of the main things that I would like for everybody to kind of um, think about, too, is that we, we, we really can't fo uh, skip over the impairment-focused rehabilitation phase, the, our green um, uh, um, uh, portion of this continuum, because if we don't do some of those fundamentals, um, you know, in, in, a, in a very effective and efficient manner with our athletes, um, some lingering issues, such things as quadriceps strength deficits and maybe perhaps joint effusion, um, those things are going to continue to haunt our athlete as they uh, make an attempt to move forward in this continuum. So we really can't rush those those things. So we were so today we are going to spend a little bit of time uh, talking about some of those things on on just how incredibly important it is to get those basic fundamentals correct so that we can um, move on to running in a very efficient uh, and hopefully safe manner. So besides helping that athlete get back to their um, their skill related sports, such as playing um, basketball or, or handball or something along those lines, um, you know, there are other reasons why we want to really think about um, trying to learn how to help our athletes uh, get back to running. And a big one is, is that once someone has an, an ACL rupture, the risk of subsequent uh, uh, ACL rupture is about 15%. And in fact, if you're a young athlete, uh, which is the primary, what, primarily what we see here at the University of Montana, 
you're talking about a 23% or not. So basically a one in four chance that that person is gonna have a uh, second um, ACL injury. So for them, that can be um, you know, quite a surprising statistic. And, and when athletes are informed of that, they may uh, make some, that might influence some of their decisions um, later on. The other thing that might also factor into this uh, decision about perhaps returning to sport is that it, it's important for athletes to understand that an ACL reconstruction is not chondroprotective. In fact, about 50% of individuals will demonstrate both the signs and symptoms of knee osteoarthritis within 10 to 15 years after the initial injury. So an ACL reconstruction doesn't reduce that rate. Um, and, and again, I think when we're talking about shared decision-making, which I'm sure Clara Dern spent a lot of time talking about, um, these are some of the statistics that I think we should be uh, sharing with them because the idea of returning back to their original sport is, is not a decision that, that should be taken lightly. So because of that, less than 65% of individuals um, actually do return to level one uh, and level two sports, which are sports that involve a high amount of uh, cutting, pivoting, and jumping um, activities. And so because of that, um, some athletes may decide that they're not going to participate in those sports anymore, and they may opt to um, take up endurance running so they can maintain um, you know, the recommended requirements for uh, vigorous and, and regular exercise so they can get the general health benefits um, from, from exercise. Uh, so recreational running uh, may actually become that soccer player's um, activity of choice after they rupture their ACL because they may be, become very fearful or may, um, uh, may decide to phase themselves out of, um, of their sport of choice. So, um, and I, I think that's a really important thing. And I think when we're talking with our athletes, um, either before they have their ACL reconstructed or perhaps during the rehabilitation uh, part or process, I think these are things that we, it's important for us to be, uh, be honest and, and have a nice open conversation with them. One of the key things that most individuals will kind of worry about, we've already kind of mentioned knee osteoarthritis once in this presentation, but one of the things that I think that can be um, increase some of this uh, fear of going back um, to, to activities is that uh, running and, and, and knee osteoarthritis kind of have this bad rap that running increases one's risk of, of developing knee osteoarthritis, particularly if there's already um, the precursors to knee osteoarthritis or even um, someone has clinically diagnosed knee osteoarthritis. But actually there's really little evidence to suggest that uh, running uh, exacerbates knee osteoarthritis or increases the rate of progression. Um, and in fact, when we look at runners um, and who have some early, early uh, signs and symptoms of knee osteoarthritis, and we compare them with individuals um, who have knee osteoarthritis that is um, basically at the same rate of progression, we see that those individuals who are runners actually have a lower, um, lower pain levels and improved function compared uh, to non-runners. So it, it seems that running um, can certainly help uh, individuals who have some early knee osteoarthritis. And as we mentioned in the previous slide, uh, knee osteoarthritis is certainly an issue for individuals who um, are post um, ACL reconstruction. One of the things we don't know, however, is we don't really know the long-term ramifications of running post ACL reconstruction. So these are data that are on people who have um, early knee osteoarthritis, but what we don't have yet at this stage, so I wanna be just a little bit cautious um, in that we don't have longitudinal data on actually returning to run after an ACL reconstruction. Like what, what is actually gonna happen um, to that knee? But I think based on these data, we can for now assume that running is a, is a safe um, activity for individuals who are returning. Um, uh, to running or what have you um, after an ACL injury. So the other thing we can do, we can take a good look at um, data on individuals who haven't had an ACL uh, rupture. And we can, what we see when we look at that, that running is actually quite, quite protective against knee osteoarthritis. Um, but of course, there's always a caveat here. So, and, and I think when we, and again, when we look at sedentary individuals, um, we see that as, as running uh, or as, um, the risk is actually quite high for both knee and hip osteoarthritis for sedentary individuals. So about 10% of, of individuals will develop um, some form of knee and hip osteoarthritis. But when we compare those to recreational runners, recre recreational runners have a about a 30% lower risk of both knee and hip osteoarthritis uh, compared with sedentary individuals. So, so recreational running seems to impart some chondroprotective um, benefits compared with being sedentary. So at the very least, we should be encouraging our individuals who recover from an ACL re uh, reconstruction to at least become active and, and perhaps uh, running is, is gonna be a great exercise mode for them. 
There is a caveat though, and that's that uh, individuals who like are elite runners or runners who run at a very high volume for uh, for a number of decades, um, they seem to have a rate of knee and hip osteoarthritis that exceeds that of the recreational runner and even exceeds that of sedentary individuals. So what I'm talking about by running a lot of volume for many years, I'm talking about perhaps going into ultra running, uh, which would be running longer than a marathon um, and doing that for, for several decades. Um, and it, from an elite runner, we're talking about being a professional runner or someone who has represented their country in some sort of international competition. So that level of running may increase one's uh, risk um, of developing um, osteoarthritis. And I think, again, that's something we really need to be uh, um, kind of emphasizing with our individuals that we're working with that, you know, recreational running, which is but far and away what we typically see, those folks are going to do quite well when it comes to a risk of neo, knee and hip OA. So in module one, we're going to talk about what are the most common impairments that can affect an athlete's ability with their return to run. So, um, and I think one of the things that, that we, we want to do, and I want to give credit to my, my colleague here uh, at the University of Montana, uh, Ryan Meisner, for um, kind of laying the, the theoretical framework for this, for this slide. Um, it's really important to understand that uh, individuals, when they're recovering um, from a, uh, a post-operative knee issue or an even acute knee injury, they're going to be experiencing all of these impairments in, in um, varying degrees. So for some athletes, they, some athletes may experience more pain than others. Other athletes may have more trouble with um, de uh, deficits in muscle force production. Um, other athletes are going to maybe have some real coordination issues. And so we're going to talk about a lot of these um, in the next Next, um, for the rest of this module as we move forward and, and how important they, they can be and how they can may perhaps affect uh, both running biomechanics uh, and also the ability, um, the ability to run. So I, we've already kind of talked very briefly about the, the, the overall continuum when we're talking about getting back, um, getting back to performance. Um, and I want to kind of show you just a little bit more detail here so we can um, just kind of talk um, a little bit more because I really want to kind of focus on this, this initial part on this initial rehabilitation on, on, on some of the things that are quite important. Um, in this initial rehabilitation, it's really important for the athlete and the clinician to, to spend a lot of time addressing those acute post-operative impairments. So things like reducing pain, getting joint effusion down at one plus or, or less, and getting terminal knee extension um, right away. And typically in our clinic, what we are looking to do is get full knee hyperextension by day three, and anything uh, longer than that becomes, um, becomes a real uh, point of concern. We want to restore, restore patellofemoral joint mobility. We wanted them to be able to do a straight leg raise without any lag in the knee. Um, and we're also going to be using NMES, not so much with the straight leg raise, but we're going to be using NMES to improve that, um, the, that uh, quadricep um, activation. And of course, we want to be getting after knee flexion. From there, stage two, we're really going to be getting into heavy, slow resistance training. And, and, and for me, when I um, see and work with other clinicians, this is where I kind of see um, things kind of falling apart a little bit is we don't have a tendency to really push our athletes and really focus on very intensive quadriceps strength training because that's going to be such a critical part uh, of what we're going to be doing. Um, and we'll see how important uh, full quadricep strength is when it comes to running biomechanics. Again, we'll continue neuromuscular electrical stimulation until they reach at least 60, perhaps even 70% of their quadricep in index. From there, we move on to stage three. Again, continuing that heavy, slow resistance training, which is going to be a long-term commitment on the part of the athlete. And at this point, we're going to be starting to do things like perturbation training, return to run, uh, and some early sport-specific agility. So what we're going to be talking a lot today about is a stage three, but we're also going to be talking a little bit about some of those things in stage one and stage two that we can set ourselves up for success. So behind my head there, what, we've got some things like heavy, slow resistance training, which is, again, is going to continue, but very sport-specific things so we can get that athlete back to, back to um, you know, return to performance. So I think first off, I think it's really important to kind of think about running um, and, and trying to think about it as just a, a single task, but think about the loads that are being experienced by the athlete. And when we when we look at them, we know that when we, a runner hits the ground, they hit the ground with about two and a half times their body weight. And at the knee, that results in about five to six body weights of patellofemoral uh, contact force. Uh, and um, those loads are applied in a very repetitive manner. Um, and for the tibial ephemeral joint, which of course is uh, the joint that's really affected by an anterior cruciate ligament injury, you know, we, we, we again see about five to six body weights of tibial femoral contact force uh, compression um, during just typical endurance pace running. Those loads are applied in a very quick and rapid manner. And so we, we see a lot of this, this kind of energy storage and release. 
And if you can kind of think about the, the leg and the, um, and the knee and the, the foot and ankle and, and hip complex when we're running as being uh, a, a series of springs. And when we land on the ground, we compress those springs, which are going to store energy, and then they very rapidly release uh, that energy. And part of our rehabilitation really needs to address that component. And we need to make sure we're not just skipping the, uh, this, uh, this energy storage and release phase and jumping right back to a return to running. And when we run, we're going to be doing those we're going to be accepting high peak loads. They're going to be applied very, very quickly, and they're going to be done so in a very in a very cumulative manner. And so for a typical 10K run, the average runner is going to take about 7,000 foot strikes, which is um, a good way to kind of think about that is 7,000 loading cycles. Um, so that's a lot of load on someone's knee. And we need to be very conscientious about the different sports that our folks are getting back to. So if someone's getting back to, say, basketball, they're going to be experiencing more peak loads because the loads when we jump are higher than what we typically see with running. Uh, but they're also going to be running and sprinting, and so those loads will be a little bit higher, as are the energy storage and release demands of that activity. But the cumulative loading is going to be a little bit less because they're not going to be running such distances as perhaps someone who is looking to get back to endurance running. And those for the endurance runner, cumulative loading is going to be a bigger issue. Peak loads are still going to be quite high. Again, we're still talking about five to six, maybe even seven body weights of patellofemoral contact force uh, and also tibial femoral contact force. And the loads are still going to be replied, or applied. Um, they're going to be, it's going to be a lot of energy storage and release. Um, but we really need to spend more time on the cumulative uh, component. So we really want to kind of shape how we're doing our rehabilitation based on the athlete in front of us. The way we're going to do that is in this kind of low dominant phase. Um, so once we get to that, out of that initial acute um, kind of impairment phase, where we're really working on trying to calm the knee down after the after that ACL reconstruction procedure, we really need to get into this heavy slow resistance training. Heavy slow resistance training is the absolute foundation for recovery for all of our athletes when they go back to sport and when they go back to daily activities. I cannot uh, overemphasize how important it is to make sure that we're doing resistance training appropriately. And we'll be talking a lot about that um, in, the next, in the next bit. From there, we're going to layer on plyometrics. Plyometrics are very helpful because they, um, you know, they, they take the, the um, rate of loading of running and they apply it in a very similar manner, but they don't have the same cumulative effect of going out for a run. So plyometrics can be a really nice bridge for the athlete to go from heavy slow resistance training to a full return to running. And with this, we want to make sure we're being um, very smart and being very objective about how we can kind of make this kind of this nice graded return uh, to running for athletes. So we're going to spend um, a lot of time talking about all three of these points and how we can kind of set um, our athletes up for a good, clean, uh, and hopefully uh, linear return um, to their sport of choice. So one of the things I think it's really important is take a, take a real quick look at the literature and kind of see basically what are some typical running biomechanics that we see often in individuals um, during that return to run process. One of the things that's really important to keep in mind, and, and I think that, I think that uh, and, uh, hopefully everybody who is tuning in for this webinar is, is also, or for all these webinars is of course listening to this one, but I think one of the things that I think is really important is that uh, I, I think clinicians often, and athletes too, think that running, running biomechanics will kind of sort themselves out as when someone goes back to running. And when we look at the data and look at the literature, that just doesn't seem to be the case. It seems that when, a, when an athlete starts to run and they are uh, exhibiting um, some running biomechanics that are atypical, those running biomechanics are going to continue on. And the reason is, is once we start doing a movement pattern repetitively, our motor learning, our motor control system kind of be begins to um, kind of assimilate that new movement pattern as normal. And so unless we make some sort of uh, serious uh, effort to make some sort of intervention and try to change some of these movement patterns, those things are going to continue on. Um, and the way our runner looks at uh, month three, uh, when they're re after they return to running after an ACL reconstruction, two years from now, uh, when we look at the data, it seems that they're still going to be looking in that, looking that, in that same um, manner. So let's just kind of take uh, a big look and just kind of look at the global loads on a runner. As I mentioned already, when we hit the ground, we, we have about two and a half times our body weight when it comes to that vertical ground reaction force. Um, and so when we, when we look at this runner, and this runner is recovering from a right anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction, and hopefully you guys can all kind of pick up that she's definitely got some, um, uh, 
some, some running gate um, disturbances there that we'll come back to that I, I think we need to spend some time working on with her. She definitely has a reduced uh, stance time on that right side and um, some other issues that we'll identify as we go forward. Um, but when we look at this vertical ground reaction force curve on the left, or on, on the right, I'm sorry, I, I, I think most people are familiar with this, but, but real briefly, at uh, zero is uh, foot strike and at 100 is uh, toe off. Uh, and this is the ground reaction forces. And, and, and this is, if you can kind of think about it this way, that you're hitting the ground and the ground is reacting and pushing back up, uh, up against you. Um, and what we typically see is we see this, this vertical impact peak when the, the foot uh, transitions from a rear foot strike to foot flat. And then we see a very high active peak, which is um, right above this um, vertical impact peak um, uh, right here at the top of this, and that's about two and a half times one's body weight. Where there's been a lot of uh, efforts, and I've published in this area some too, but um, you know, we're starting to see that this is perhaps not as important, this idea of this loading rate, which is this impact phase, which has really uh, garnered a lot of attention. And I think probably it's a, it's a good time for us to really take a good hard look to see if um, there is really enough evidence to say that this is something important um, in a lot of our runners. But what we do know is that there's no difference between limbs for our athletes um, in that peak vertical ground reaction force, which is that highest part of that vertical ground reaction force curve. Um, and uh, the impact forces or those loading rates, which we've, we've heard so much about um, for the last decade or so, again, there's no difference not only between limbs, but there's also no difference between people who have had an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction and um, those who are healthy controls. What we do see is that individuals who have some quadricep weakness tend to have a lower peak vertical ground reaction force. So that, that seems almost counterintuitive, uh, but when you, when you have this quadricep weakness, you, you can't control the loads as well, and we don't tend to strike the ground quite as hard. And we, we actually need to kind of strike the ground. There has to be some striking of the ground that, uh, with some force, because again, we're, we're storing, and then we're gonna release that energy. And if you're not hitting the ground with some energy, you're not gonna store any energy either. So let's kind of zoom in on the knee. And let's first time start looking at uh, this runner's biomechanics at foot strike. And the big thing that we see when, again, when we look at the literature, and this is from a, a systematic review that, um, that our group um, uh, published in uh, sports medicine last year, uh, and also uh, some literature um, out of Latrobe University in Melbourne. Um, one of the things that, that we see at, at foot strike is that the, uh, compared with the other limb and also compared with um, healthy um, matched uh, controls is that people after an, after an ACL reconstruction tend to land uh, in greater knee flexion. When we look at the mechanics at foot strike, um, I'm sorry, mid stance, one of the things that we see too is reduced uh, peak knee flexion. I'm going to go ahead and slide my image over to the other side. And we see reduced knee flexion excursion. And um, what we also see is reduced knee extensor moment. So let's spend some time talking about that a little bit. So what we see is the knee does not bend quite as much in that, at that peak uh, part of loading, so during, that, um, during mid stance. Um, and because we are already landing with the knee slightly more bent uh, and more knee flexion um, than the other side, and we don't go into as much knee flexion, what happens then is the amount of excursion that's occurring is much less at the knee. And part of that, too, is we're not absorbing as much energy. And so the energy absorption at the knee tends to be much less. And then because we're not bending the knee as much, the other thing that happens, too, is the knee extensor moment is also less. And the biggest contributor to the internal knee extensor moment are the quadricep musculature. So this is kind of what we see, and this is um, maybe perhaps a little bit uh, counterintuitive that we then see greater patellofemoral joint uh, stress. And so the, uh, the pressure underneath the kneecap uh, ends up being quite a bit less. And that, again, it might seem counterintuitive because the quadricep um, forces are, we, we're probably thinking that those are less. But remember, the knee is not flexed as much. And as a result, that, that contact area between the patella um, and the femur is much, much less. And so we end up getting greater, greater stress that's occurring between the kneecap uh, and, and the femur. So it's not surprising that one of the things that we see in runners is we, we tend to see a high prevalence or high incidence of patellofemoral um, type complaints um, in people after they're recovering from an anterior cruciate ligament uh, reconstruction. 
So these are some data um, from ours, uh, from our lab, where we actually, we looked at individual who, individuals who are post partial meniscectomy. So, you know, again, these are, I, I wanna make sure that I'm pointing out that these are not people that have had an anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction. But I think these data are very helpful because we've also, uh, we also see the same kind of movement pattern in, in, in individuals who are recovering from an ACL reconstruction. This is what's called the support moment. And what we're doing here is we're looking at the, contribu the contributions from the ankle, the knee, and the hip during uh, endurance pace running. So in this case, they're running about 3.3 meters per second, um, which is about an eight minute mile. Um, and when we look at this, um, you can see that whether you've had your uh, a men a meniscectomy or not, um, or you're looking at the control limb, uh, we don't. We see that the ankle, the contribution from the ankle doesn't really change a lot. And so running is pred predominantly an ankle uh, plantar flexor activity. But what we do see up at the hip and the knee is, is quite important. And we see that we see the shifting of that load or the, the contribution to the support moment. We see it shifting away from the knee and up to the hip. So it seems to shift proximally. And that's when you're looking at not just between limbs and the, and the same individual, but we also see it when, uh, particularly when we're looking at um, healthy matched control. So you can see that we see about 36 to 33 to 36% and that um, uh, and the healthy controls. And that goes the whole way down to 29% um, of this total support is coming from the knee in someone who's had a partial meniscectomy. I think the partial meniscectomy individuals are really um, helpful because people who have had an ACL reconstruction move very similarly. And when we think about like what actually might influence that in this data set, one of the things that we did, and this is the big reason why I want to show these data, is that the knee, the COOS quality of life uh, subscale seems to really predict this movement uh, pattern quite well. And, and I think that's really important because the COOS um, sport subscale doesn't, even though the, the COOS uh, sport subscale asks particularly about running pain. Instead, the thing that really seemed to affect this was um, the individual's um, knee confidence. And so as knee confidence went down, the amount that they loaded their knee also went down and they tended to shift more load up to their hip. So how confident someone is in their knee health seems to really affect um, their overall movement uh, quality. There seems to at least be, seems to be a relationship set there. So it's not unusual for us to see individuals post ACL reconstruction and post other knee surgeries like a partial meniscectomy to, to come in and actually have quite strong hip extensors, but actually quite weak um, knee extensors. And so uh, I think it's important when we're talking about how we're rehabbing people, but also how we're thinking about um, their movement patterns. So what are some things that really, really factor into um, the way that we move? So when we're looking at uh, some really nice data, um, again, out of, out of Latrobe um, University, and, and they looked at individuals that had, um, well, they divided them into two different groups, high functioning individuals and low functioning individuals. So these are people that had 85% or greater on their uh, LSI on their hop test, and also um, greater than 85% on their Cincinnati um, knee pain um, score. Um, and low functioning would be um, below that um, benchmark of 85%. Um, and what, what we're seeing here, and again, remember, we, we see lower knee extension, new knee extension uh, moments. Um, and this is actually looking at the peak knee external flexion moment, which is equal and opposite of the internal moment. And also lower peak vertical ground reaction forces. We see those in people who have a, tend to have a lower um, self-reported knee function and lower hop ability. I bring this up because I think it's really important for us to not separate out someone's hopping ability from their running ability. And we probably need to spend some time trying to uh, get some resolution on their hopping ability before we get the, them um, back to running. So again, hop uh, capability, um, seems to there seems to be a relationship there with our, our running biomechanics. As I mentioned earlier, patellofemoral pain is a major, major issue and individuals post ACL reconstruction. This is some great data from Lee Harrington and his group out of the out of the UK. And one of the things that we see is that um, you know that we see about 30% of all individuals experience patellofemoral pain post ACL reconstruction. It doesn't seem to be influenced a lot by graft type. So we often kind of think that uh, bone patellar tendon bone. Uh, graphs, um, those individuals who have that graph tend to experience more knee pain. But according to this, that doesn't really seem to have much influence on, on patellofemoral pain. Um, and what we do see is that not only do they experience more pain, but 
We also see that um, patellofemoral joint stress in individuals who have had an ACL reconstruction tends to be about 23% greater than the opposite limb. And then we also see that it's almost 25% uh, greater than uh, healthy match control. So patellofemoral joint stress is a, is a real issue um, after ACL reconstruction. One of the things too, when we think about like knee pain, because it is a real big issue um, after ACL reconstruction, we used to really think that knee pain um, after this after this surgery had something to do with the fact that we were putting too much load on them during during rehab. But actually, what seems to really affect or uh, have a beneficial effect um, on reducing the risk of patellofemoral pain is if we try to get um, earlier loading on these athletes. And so I think that. Um, um, we, I think we all know that the patellofemoral joint doesn't do very well with very, with very rapid changes in, in, in workload. So when, we're, when you guys are doing rehab, I think it's important for us to really get after those quadriceps uh, quite early on. I think it's important not to spend too much time doing things like straight leg raises, but getting after and really loading that knee, um, in particular uh, doing lots of heavy slow resistance training. So again, main point on this slide is that patellofemoral joint stress and patellofemoral pain um, is, a, is a real issue for individuals recovering um, from an ACL reconstruction. So quadriceps, and this is what I've kind of been hinting at for a while, quadricep function is a major predictor of knee biomechanics during running, particularly during uh, or after ACL reconstruction. So we see that um, as quadricep strength goes down, knee flexion excursion goes down. As quadricep strength goes down, the knee extension moment also goes down during running. And in this study from uh, Paul Klein um, and, and his group, um, they also did a, a functional type test, which is this 20 centimeter single leg step down test. And what they were looking to see is um, if the number of step downs they could do where they came down, they tapped their heel on the ground. If that had a, uh, some sort of relationship with how much knee flexion excursion occurred during running and also the knee extension moment. And if you look at the R square there, the performance during that single leg step down was even, uh, that relationship was even stronger um, with, a, with knee flexion excursion than it was um, for uh, peak isometric um, quadricep strength. So I bring that up because um, it, it's probably not so much, not as not solely about quadricep strength, but it also probably has a lot to do with quadricep um, uh, coordination and, 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 and control um, when you're doing an activity. So I think both of these are some good activities or good tests that we can probably do with our athletes when we're getting them ready um, to return to run. So these are some nice data. This is uh, out of the University of Michigan. Um, and, and, and this is looking at, um, this isn't really looking at running, but this is actually looking at a, at a forward hop landing, uh, which is gonna be a little more stressful on the knee than, than running it. And sometimes we really wanna see big differences in knee biomechanics. One of the things that can be really helpful is to um, not look at something that's like, like a simple or a low demand task like walking, but instead look at something that's a, it's a really, really high demand activity. And in this case, that, that forward hop landing is very helpful. So when we look at this, what we see is runners, or not runners, but athletes who had a quad index um, below 80 seem to have going to less knee flexion. They, send it, they tend to land a little stiffer um, than, than those who had a quad index um, uh, of 80 um, and above. Um, however, when we look at that uh, knee extension moment, Again, this is a knee extension uh, symmetry index. What we see is that if you start getting a quad index below 90, this is when we really start seeing a, a large drop off on the knee extension um, moment. Okay, so that peak knee extension moment. So again, it seems like the, 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 the ability to generate uh, force from the quadriceps seems to be uh, of, of critical importance um, and even more so important um, for that, um, for your knee, your internal knee extension moment. So that'll conclude module one. We're gonna pivot into module two. We're gonna, we've already identified the problems and now what we're gonna do in this next phase, is we're gonna really spend a lot of time talking about how we can prepare the athlete for that return to run process and just how we can really focus on those basic building blocks.